When my brother was 18, he broke his arm in an accident that ended in another young man's death. I wish I could tell you that we mourned the boy who died, but we did not. He was the one with murder in his heart, and sure enough, death found him that night. Funny how that works. It happened at the lake, Wild Lake, named not for Oscar, but Fraser B. Who, you may well ask. I had to look it up myself, and I'm a native to these parts. Fraser Bullard Wild was president of Connecticut General, an insurance company, when longtime customer Jim Rouse decided in the 1960s that he wanted to build a new town utopia in Maryland farmland, midway between Baltimore and Washington, D.C., Connecticut General provided funding and agreed that Rouse should acquire the land stealthily, parcel by parcel, keeping prices low. Rouse was a good man, church-going, modest, indifferent to his personal fortune, careful with his company's coffers. Yet Columbia, Maryland, the egalitarian experiment that he probably considered his greatest legacy, began in deceit. Again, funny how that works. Wild Lake on the Surface is a legal thriller, the story of a new prosecutor who's just been elected, wants to make her name, and therefore is going to try all the murder cases that come in. Not that there are very many murder cases in her suburban county. But a case does come in. It seems to be good enough um, in that it's pretty slam dunk. A uh, woman has been strangled and beaten in her apartment. And a homeless man has been arrested, fingerprints at the scene. And yet as she begins to prepare for the case, she is startled to find how it makes her look back at a violent incident in her brother's past when he defended a friend who was being attacked by two men, outraged that their sister's accusation of rape had been dismissed and found to have no merit. And in defending his friend, her brother inadvertently caused the death of one of those brothers. Lou Brandt is extremely competitive, but as Lou Brandt notes in the book, have you ever noticed that only other competitive people tell you how competitive you are? It's something of the Brandt family tradition to be competitive. Her father had the very job that she now holds. Her brother was not only a brilliant student, he's a lawyer who also has an MBA, and in even trying to sort of drop out of the worldly world has ended up becoming richer than ever, preaching the um, credo of simplicity. They're very tight-knit. Um, Lou's mother died within a week of her birth, so it's just the three of them and a housekeeper. And they also consider loyalty to be one of the most important aspects of their family. They're extremely loyal to each other. They're a bit of a close tribe, and although they would never admit it, yeah, they do think they're a little bit better than everyone else. A little smarter, better intentioned. They're the good guys. And all the tragedy that befalls the family lies in this assumption that they know what's right and they do what's right. Columbia is a place I know really well. I went to high school there. And it's the perfect place for this particular story about well-intentioned people thinking they know best and seeing things go wrong. The first families of Columbia, the people who moved there in the late 1960s and early 70s, they were really believers. This was just not a suburb. It was a new way of living. It was going to change how people lived. And unfortunately, it came up against the intractable fact of human nature. You know, people, there's, people are reluctant to live alongside people who are different from them, who think differently. And this experiment has been some, something of a failure. And it's interesting to me, I've kind of stayed in touch with Columbia, if you will, because I have a stepson who grew up there. So I've spent much of the past 20 years going to soccer games and basketball games and school plays. And I was surprised to find that I was a little bit sad and distressed to see how far Columbia had drifted from its initial concept. The Columbia that I knew had what we call subsidized housing, affordable housing, Section 8 housing, right next to the nice middle-class houses. And now 
as the suburb has spread west into the west part of the county, an affordable home is a townhouse that costs $350,000. It's really in the zeitgeist right now, this discussion about how do we deal with judging people we once admired in history when we come to realize that they do not begin to meet our current standards of what a good person is. Uh, this debate has been raging in the United States. It, Princeton University, they had to decide whether they were going to keep Woodrow Wilson's name on the College of International Studies. The problem being that Wilson was not a very admirable man. He was very much a racist. Um, you know, even by the standards of his time, he was extreme in his views. In New Orleans, where I live part-time, they voted to take down the statues of the Confederate war heroes. But at the same time, they don't want to take down the statue of Andrew Jackson, the president who overlooks Jackson Square in New Orleans and is known as the hero of the Battle of New Orleans. And we get all kind of wrapped up in trying to figure out, well, how do we deal with the past? And in my mind, the way we deal with the past is with at least some kindness and the understanding that it's not going to be that long. And I mean, really, in five or ten years, we may find that things we said today, jokes we tell today, um, snap judgments we make about people not understanding yet how brain chemistry works, we may regret those very things we're saying and doing now. I think in some ways we're way too harsh on the past and we need to let it be and move on. This story began with my decision to take the events of To Kill a Mockingbird and to see how they would play out differently in a very different time and place. The point of To Kill a Mockingbird is that Tom Robinson is innocent and as a black man in the United States in the 1930s, there's no amount of evidence that will allow a jury to acquit him of a crime he clearly did not commit. But as we move forward and we think about the issue of sexual assault and the increasing exhortation to believe people when they say they've been sexually assaulted, something that I believe, that, that we should believe victims, we should stop being quite so skeptical and this issue of false accusation is way overblown in people's minds. So I thought, okay, you take sort of the same framework, you move it to a different place and a different time. What does the story become? I mean, from the very first line of Wild Lake, I'm invoking To Kill a Mockingbird. I didn't call a lot of attention to it. I don't even mention it in my author's note because the book is not meant to be a retelling. It's not the sort of book where someone sets out as homage to just modernize a beloved story as, say, Curtis Sittenfeld did with Jane Austen and her book Eligible. But there are all sorts of Easter eggs in Wild Lake for people like me who absolutely love To Kill a Mockingbird. Um, two of them that no one has caught, I've started bringing them up now. Uh, first of all, the Brant name. Uh, a lot of people don't know what a Brant is. Well, it's a bird. And of course, the family in To Kill a Mockingbird is the Finch family. And the other thing is that Rudy Drysdale, who clearly is my stand-in for Boo Radley, well, Drysdale is an anagram for Radley's. Writing Wild Lake didn't change my opinion of what the truth is because I came into the book feeling that truth is pretty elusive and it changes from person to person. There is no single truth. It's just that each individual has a story they believe to be true. And I think sometimes even in our heart of hearts, we know that our truth isn't universal and would be challenged by someone else. The characters in this book, if you could talk to them, even the members of the Brant family, won't agree on what the truth of the situation is. And in some ways, this book is an examination of that very fact. Lou says, you know, in the law you talk about the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. She says, there is no such thing, and if you could find it, you'd wish you didn't. <laughs>